When I was towards the end of elementary school, I was trying to find my cool, right? Because when you come towards the, element, the end of elementary school, you realize that a lot of people are looking at you, trying to find out, does this guy have something unique? Is he interesting? Uh, at the time, I was growing into my very, very British teeth. If you don't get that joke, I would tell you to go Google British teeth, but I don't want to traumatize you, uh, so don't do it. But I needed something. Things were not going well for me, so I needed something to make me cool. And what I decided in my adolescent awkwardness was the thing that I needed was I needed to learn how to play a musical instrument. That would get the girls interested in me. That would get the guys wanting to be like me. But in my weirdness, because I was a weird kid, the instrument that I chose was not the drums. It wasn't the guitar. It was the trumpet. And I thought that I could look like this guy. I thought that I was going to be the coolest trumpet player of all time. So what I decided to do was I signed up for a youth orchestra. And what they did is they would test you when you first came in. They test you for rhythm, things like that. And then they assign you the instrument that they think best fits where you're at. They didn't assign me a trumpet. They assigned me the French horn. Not cool. <laughs> right? It's clunky. It's big. It's French. It's not cool, right? Nobody wants to be the French horn player. But there was hope because they told me if I work really hard and I play real good and it looks like my skills are developing, then they might move me to a different instrument. So I did my best. I worked real hard and they did move me to the tuba. <laughs> right? This is not working out. I'm hemorrhaging friends at this point, right? Now, before all the brass instrument players in the room turn against me, as an adult, I now realize actually how unique these instruments are. And at the time, I didn't really appreciate this opportunity that I was getting to play some of the most unique, some of the most beautiful instruments. I was not at all appreciating them for the music that they produced. You see, music and instruments was, for me, just a tool, something that I could use to get something that I wanted. And the real sadness about that is that when I did that, I missed out on everything that they could be and should be for someone who's playing them. And what that's got to do with what we're talking about this morning is that when we talk about God, we often treat him the same way that I treat music. He's kind of a vehicle to get something that we want. And we don't do something very, very important, which is seek him. Seek him for who he is as an end in himself. Not as a means to an end, not as something to get us somewhere else, but to, for him himself to be the end of everything that we want, everything that we desire. That's what seeking is. That's what we're talking about this morning. And seeking is really important for us because as we continue in this series of the disciplines of grace, and we talk about these ways in which we can train ourselves to love God and to love our neighbors more, this is the one that helps orient the others. If you want to know why we listen, if you want to know why we obey, if you want to know why we confess, it's because we want to seek the face of God. It's because we want to seek to know him better, to know who he is, that he in himself is the end of everything that we truly desire and need in this life and for all eternity. So we are going to be jumping right in to look at a passage where Jesus talks about seeking this morning. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Matthew 6. If you don't, we're going to have it up on the screen for you, so don't worry. And we're going to look at three things together. We're going to look at what to seek, who to seek, and then how to seek. So let me read this passage with you. This is Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. This is what it says. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the beds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The first thing that I want to talk about together is what to seek. What to seek. Have you ever noticed when you are on the internet uh, and you're roaming around the very uh, many different sites that you can go to, that every so often you will notice the same ad popping up on every single website, and it's almost as though they are reading your mind. They know way too much about you, right? It's very big business these days to track and record the little bits of data of what people do on the internet. Businesses will go crazy for this because that helps them to better market their products. So what they do is everything you Google, everything you search, everything you click on, somewhere is being logged and tracked. And then companies use this to figure out what's most important to you. Now they did this to me this summer. Uh, this summer, uh, we were expecting our third baby. So I was posting a lot of things about that and I was talking a lot on Facebook, different things about having a baby. Uh, if you know anything about me, you also know I love superheroes. I probably Google them more than I should. The government is very worried about me. And uh, this is the ad that kept popping up. Fathor. Just like dad, just way mightier. And it just kept coming on. Every website I would go on, when I was just scrolling through Facebook, this would kept coming up. And I was like, how do they know? How do they know that I'm going to be a dad? How do they know that I love Thor? How do they know that I'm handsome and exceptional? <laughs> how did they get all this information on me? The truth is, is life is a lot like the way that the internet works these days. The little details of our life will be projecting an idea of what's most important to us, what we value most. If we could take all the little data points of your life, what you spend your time on, the people that you spend your time with, the things that you say, the things that you think, the things that you spend your money on, my question to you this morning is, what image would that produce? What would people say is the most important thing to you? If there was a company trying to figure out what is most important to you and they could look at absolutely everything, what would it be? Jesus' challenge to us is that the thing that should be most important to us is God's kingdom. In this little section, he is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, one of his favorite sermons, his most famous sermon. And Jesus is talking about not being anxious. And this is what he says. He starts out in verse 25. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he jumps at the end of this little talk. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. See, seeking God begins with us taking an honest look at what is most important to us. What are the things that we give ourselves to most often? Jesus is trying to work that out with his listeners. He's trying to work that out with us at all times. What's most important to us? He's bringing up here the things that people need to live their lives. He talks about clothing. He talks about food. He talks about drink. And these really are placeholders for anything that we worry about because we know we have to have it. Because we need it for our life to work out. But if we look at our own culture, it doesn't have to just stop with this. Jesus isn't simply meaning the things that are essential to biological life. Jesus is trying to capture the things that we all think we need to have the most full life possible. The things that we think we need to satisfy the longings of our heart. And what Jesus says to his listeners and what he says to us if we'll hear him is what we should be putting first. If we want those things, if we value those things, is him is his kingdom. If we seek God's kingdom first, then God will add all the things that we need because he knows that we need him. But if we chase those things as ends in and of themselves, if we put those first and prioritize money or even family or work, then we might not end up having those longings satisfied. Now, Jesus is not saying that those things are bad. In of themselves. He's not saying that to long for these things are bad. Of course it's not bad, especially with food and drink. He's not saying don't care about those when he says don't be anxious. He's simply saying don't make that the priority of your life. Make God the priority and trust that in his love for you and in his care for you, he will take care of that. That's why Jesus uses these analogies of the lilies of the field. He says, look at them. Look at the way that they don't toil or gather but God cares for them. He provides for them. 
Doesn't God care about you more than those things? And if he does, if you are of more value than those things, then isn't he worth prioritizing in life? Isn't he worth making the goal of everything you do? If that's how great his love for you is. C.S. Lewis once said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. A different spin on what Jesus says. The idea is this, is if we prioritize Jesus, we will better see that he is prioritizing us. That if we make him the center and the goal of everything that we do in our lives, we will better know the love that he has for us in the way that he provides for us, the way that he cares for us. But if we are distracted by all these other things, if we are spending all of our time and our energy trying to build our lives for ourselves, we're not gonna as clearly see the God who loves us and cares for us. Is God something you use to get the things that you value or are the things that you value something that you use to serve and to seek God? Different way to think about them. I think the truth is we can often think that we're seeking God when in truth we're simply using God to seek something else. I do this all the time. I wish that I could be the kind of preacher who gets up here and says, you know, let me tell you how it's done. I've got it together. But the truth is, sometimes I wonder whether God has asked me to do this because I'm the worst at it and he wants everybody else to go, see, don't do that. (laughs) Because the truth is, there's so many areas of my life where I, I prioritize something else. I can even do it in this pulpit. I can come up here and talk about Jesus, talk about the Bible, talk about these things that should be important. But in my heart, the thing that's most important to me, the thing that's consuming my thoughts is, am I okay? Do people think that I'm successful? Is doing this making God love me more? Is doing something for God, doing these different disciplines, is that making my life of more significance? And God said, don't concern yourself with that. Look at me. Look at who I am. Look at what I've done for you. What is it for you? What are you tempted to put before God's kingdom? What are you tempted to let consume your thoughts and your time and your energy? Is it family? Is it work? Is it politics? Finances? All things that are good and important, as long as they come in the right order. God has to come first, and that's why we need to see who to seek. Who to seek. So let's talk about who to seek. You guys ever went for your annual physical and you sit down with a doctor and you hear things like, lay off the dairy, try and get a little bit more exercise. Right? My worst time of year. He always says things like that to me. And we all agree with that, right? Like we sit, we listen to the doctor, we say, yes, I should eat less dairy. Yes, I should exercise more. But then do we do it when we leave the doctor's office? No, I go and get myself some Dairy Queen immediately right? But no one would ever say to the doctor's face that we're not going to do it. No one ever sits in the office and when he says, lay off the dairy, we say, no doc, dairy makes my dreams come true, (laughs) right? The truth is, is we often will talk about seeking the kingdom of God because in our mind, we agree with the principle of it. We agree with the principle. We think it's good. We know it's important. But the question is, are we actually responding to the person who wants to be sought? Are we actually listening to his words? Are we putting into action the things that sure we are seeking him? Because seeking is an active response. It's not something that happens just in our mind. It's something that happens in the way that we live our lives. It's something that we do. Jesus' big finish in this is he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. He's asking us to do something. He's not simply asking us to change the way that we think. He's saying, I want you to actively, in your life, seek first the kingdom of God. To seek the kingdom of God makes, means to make Jesus the king. It means to place ourselves under his authority, to trust his words to us are the best. To be a Christian really is not to agree with ideas, it's to surrender to a king. See, Jesus is not an advisor or a teacher 
or a coach. He is primarily a king. The one who is the end of all things, the one who was the beginning of all things, and he calls us to seek him, a person living and active. I want to talk about the two phrases in what Jesus says here, the kingdom of God and then his righteousness. The easiest way I can try and articulate to us this morning what the kingdom of God is, is to repeat something that Pastor Jeff has said a lot. The kingdom of God is wherever the rule and reign of Jesus is. The kingdom is the rule and reign of Jesus. It's wherever his words are put into action. Seeking God means not simply agreeing in your mind that Jesus is a good king. It's living in your life like he is a good king. Am I bringing the elements of my life to him and saying, Jesus, I want you to have authority over this. I want you to be the one that directs this. I want to care about what you care about, Jesus. I want your will to be my will. Are those the kind of questions that we ask about the ways that we live our lives? Let me ask another question. Is Christ more your Lord today than he was yesterday or last week or last year? Because the goal is not perfection here. When we talk about obeying Jesus and seeking him and changing our lives to reflect that, I'm not saying that we're going to do that flawlessly. I certainly know that I don't do it flawlessly. But the question we can ask ourselves to get a better idea of whether we are actually seeking is, is that growth? Is that movement in our hearts towards loving these things more? Desiring these things more? Seeking ways that we can do them better? The second thing that Jesus says is his righteousness. What does he mean by that, seeking his righteousness? The most important thing that we believe as Christians is that God loves us and bases his relationship with us not off what we do, but off what he has done through his son Jesus. I believe as a Christian that God loves me and cares for me, not because I have lived up to the standard of what I should be, but because Jesus has lived up to the standard of what I should be. And he has at the cross given me that wonderful life, that perfect life. And the way that the Bible describes what he did on the cross sometimes is him gifting us his righteousness. He gives us his righteousness. I think that what Jesus is talking about when he says, seek first his righteousness, it means seeking first to be justified not by the way that we live our lives, but by the way that Jesus has lived his life. By trusting and believing always and first and foremost that the anchor of our relationship with God is Jesus and not us. Because we can get caught up, especially when we talk about these disciplines and the things that we want to be doing in our life, we can convince ourselves, oh, I'm, I'm doing this so that Jesus will love me more. And when we do that, we stop seeking. We've actually started to seek ourselves. We're thinking about what we're doing and who we are. And we should be looking always at his righteousness, the love that he has poured out on us through his son at the cross, that he would give us his most precious son. You see, the truth is, as much as we are called to seek him, he is seeking us first. To seek God is not to try and find him in some dark and hidden place, as many other religions are. The gospel is the knowledge that we are seeking because he has sought us, because he has came into our world, lived with us, walked with us, died for us, given us his spirit. He is seeking us as much as we are called to seek him. If he did that for us, how can we not give our utmost? How can we not be propelled and motivated to say, I want every corner of my life to point back to this, to think about this, to be changed by this? So let's talk about the details of how to do that. Let's talk about how to seek. How to seek. Psalm 119 verses 9 and 10 says this. It says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I wish I could read to you the entirety of Psalm 119 this morning because it's, it's a very long psalm all about the ways in which we can seek after God and train ourselves and change ourselves through his spirit and through his guidance. And the beauty of this is it is giving us the foundation of how we are to seek. Guarding our lives according to your word not wandering from his commandments. The way to seek God 
is to bring his words into all the areas of our life, not allowing anything to be off limits to God and letting Christ become the goal of all we do, saying that everything we do in our work, in our family, in our finances, the goal is gonna be Jesus. The goal is gonna be knowing him better for myself and helping others see him for who he is. And if that's the case, then seeking cannot be done once a week on a Sunday morning. It's something that's an ongoing exercise, something we've got to do every day in every place of our lives. So to simplify it a little bit for us this morning, because there is so much that we could talk about when we talk about this, I want to talk about four basic areas that we can seek God in our lives together. The first place is we're to seek him in our family. We ought to seek God in our family. Now, I think that when Janine and I first got married, we were a lot better at this. It's something that we really cared about and together said we want to do this together. But as time has gone on and kids have multiplied and the busyness of life has multiplied, we're not so good at it anymore. And I think that's probably the main reason in a lot of our families we don't seek God in the ways that we could is because business kind of takes over. Things get really crazy. So the first thing that we can do in our families to seek God is to make time is to put it first, to make it a priority, to work it into our family's weekly schedule, to put our attention on Jesus. And I don't want you to think this morning that unless you're doing two hours, three hours, four hours, or some huge spiritual exercise that for some reason you're not seeking God. You, you can seek God in five minutes on a morning with your spouse. You can seek God around a dinner table with your family when you're eating with your kids. That's the joy of seeking God is it's not about how much you do it. It's about what you do. It's about the little things. It's about simply making as much time as you can for Jesus in your family. Husbands and wives, make time to seek Jesus together. Do you guys pray together? Do you guys talk about what God's doing in your lives together? Is there conversations about God's kingdom happening in your marriage outside of church on Sunday morning or even maybe just small group during the week? Again, it doesn't have to be something huge. Maybe it's something that you can do together in the morning when you wake up is to turn and say, hey, can I pray for you today before we get everything started? Can we take two minutes? Can we take one minute just to ask Jesus to come to be a part of our family, to be a part of our marriage? Do you talk about the ways that you can love one another better and seek to find those places where you can ask for forgiveness from your spouse. Sometimes seeking Jesus is as simple as asking for forgiveness, recognizing that there's something that you could be doing better, and telling that to your spouse. Parents, make it a goal in your life to prioritize helping your kids see Jesus. This is something that matters to me a lot as a middle school director because I know that the real disciple is in the lives of the students in this church is not me, it's not Tom and Gretchen in the high school ministry, it's not Miss Becky in the kids department, it's you, the parents. You are God's first means of teaching your kids about himself. You're the best at it as well. They will pay so much more attention to what you say than what I say or Tom and Gretchen say. They will pay so much more attention to the way that you talk to Jesus in your life. And I want you to be encouraged too because I know a lot of parents get discouraged because you try and pray with your kids or you try and bring up spiritual things and they're kind of like, oh, I don't know. But don't be discouraged by that. Don't be put off by that because that's actually okay. That's normal. The best thing you can do is just to be consistent. Find little things that you can do together. Maybe talk once a week with your kids. Hey, what, what are you reading in God's word? Do you have any questions about Jesus? Is there anything going on in your mind that you've wondered about Jesus? Don't worry about having all the answers. Simply asking the question sometimes is showing them that you're seeking God, that God's a priority, that he's not something that you want them to do in the background and hope that they figure it out on their own. It shows that you care about him, that he's a priority to you too. The second place that we can seek him in our lives is in our work. We can seek God in our work. It's easy for a lot of us to see our work, our employment is simply this place that we go to get the money to do the real stuff that we want to do. And none of us, uh, I think, probably go to work and love it the way that we should. 
But God actually really values the workplace. He values where you work. He sees it as a mission field. He actually put you there intentionally on purpose to seek him there because he's going to be found there. Now, this doesn't mean that you've got to pop up a box in the break room, stand on top and go, repent. That's, that's not what seeking God in your workplace looks like. Seeking God in your workplace is as simple as choosing to get to know your co-workers. Praying for them. You don't even need to pray with them right there in the workplace and make a big deal out of it. Maybe just make sure you know their names. Get to know what's going on in their lives. I know I've worked in a lot of places where there are a lot of faces. I don't know their names. I don't know their families. I don't know what's going on. But God has sent me in that workplace to to be an advocate for them, to seek him on their behalf in that workplace, to love them, to serve them. There are some people that we don't like to serve at work, people that we don't like. Joe from the copy room, something like that. We hate that guy. But you guess what? If you hate him, there's a better reason to love him the most, especially. Be the one that goes out of the way to find those in your workplace that need love, that need service, that need support. Seek God in your workplace. Help those that need to see Jesus see him in your workplace. Go above and beyond. Don't be the person who waits to let someone else serve and love those around you in your workplace. And seize those opportunities that you do have when people do eventually ask you the question, hey, why, why are you the way that you are? Use the opportunity to say, let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus and why I care about people, why it's important to me that I serve others. How is your attitude at work reflecting what is a priority to you in your personal life? The third place we can seek God, and this is a big one, is in our finances. We can seek God in our finances. What does your monthly expenditures look like? What are you spending your money on the most? It's true that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. Our money is one of the best indicators of telling us what's most important to us. The uncomfortable truth is it's very easy to spend our money on all the things that we want and then give Jesus the leftovers. But if Jesus is fast, if the kingdom of God is fast, if his righteousness is fast, then that means we've got to maybe sometimes ask some important questions about where we are sending our dollars. Now that might mean, might mean helping to give to your local church. But I want to be very clear so that before God, I can get this right to you because giving to your local church is not the same thing as seeking God with your finances. It's a way you can do that. But seeking God with your finances is simply about, again, asking Jesus, I want you to have authority over how I use my money. I want you to have a voice in what I'm spending my money on. You could do it by supporting a missionary overseas. You could do it by supporting a local organization that's serving the needs of your city. You could do it by supporting the family that lives next door that can't quite make their bills this month. You can even do it in the way that you tip at a restaurant. I had a fantastic sermon one time about how Christians should be so generous that people love to get Christians coming to their restaurants because they'll be the best tippers. And as funny as that sounds, I think that that's actually a beautiful way to think about how you can be generous and how you can seek God in your finances. Realizing that every dollar you send out can be a way of projecting what's most important to you. Is generosity important to you? Is giving to others and supporting others as important to you as giving to yourself and the things that you want? The last place that we must seek God is in our own heart. And this one is important. Because we can seek him in all those other places, but if we do not do it in our own heart, we're missing it. Let me explain this one by way of my own story with you guys as we come to a close here. You see, when I first became a Christian, I was around 16, 17, and I would have told you that all these things were important to me, that I want to make my life about following Jesus that I want to seek God in work and in friendships and in family and in finances. But the truth is, as a young person, the one place I wasn't seeking him was in my own heart. I was treating God just like I treat that French horn. He was something to get me what I wanted, something that was second to other things in my life so that he could help me get those things that were first. And God, in his love for me, 
in his grace for me, pushed on me. As a good father, he said, Andrew, there's something better. There is a better way to live as a follower of Jesus than having other things first. I was really good at seeking God where people were looking at me, but when I was on my own, it was a different story. And God in his mercy, through mentors, through friends, through the church, helped me see that having him first was the best way to deal with the things that I was really after. See, as a kid, and even as an adult, I'm a very anxious person. When I read this passage and Jesus said, do not be anxious, I know he's talking to me. There's things in my life that I get afraid of. There's things in my life that I worry about. I worry about my kids. I worry about the way people perceive me. I worry about a lot of things. And the truth is that I will go to so many different places to try and get those needs met. And God loves me so much as he says, there's a better place. Come to me. Make the thing that you are spending your thoughts on me. It doesn't mean that we won't be anxious and we won't be fearful, but it does mean that we will have one who will care for us and love us. And that's what this is really about. Seeing the one who cares for you and loves you. Seeking is about making time in your life so that you can see the one who loves you. Pastor David Platt says it this way. Followers of Jesus are not people for whom Jesus is a part of their life. Followers of Jesus are people for whom Jesus is their life. Dear friends, there is nothing in this life worth more of your time than Jesus. Because when you do know him and you grow in the knowledge of him who has loved you so much, you will find a one who can satisfy the longings of your soul. The challenge for this week, we're gonna take from just a little earlier in Matthew's gospel. And earlier in the same chapter, Matthew 6, where Jesus prays what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer. And he prays like this in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our challenge this week is to wake up every morning and to pray those words. To pray to God and say, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life and through my life. Asking God through his spirit to help us make him the priority. I will be praying with you and praying this for myself as well. And I'm excited to see what happens when we put first the one who has loved us with an everlasting love. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father, I thank you that though we seek you, you have sought us first. But Lord, let us not sit on that complacently, but let us rejoice knowing that you have loved us so that we might chase after you, not simply in our minds, but in our actions, God. God, I pray that we would be the kind of church that seeks you not only on Sunday mornings, but in our families, in our workplaces, in our finances, in our own heart, in the secret places when no one is looking, because you are worth seeking, because you are worth being inconvenienced, changing things around so that we can see your love. Jesus, you are perfect, and we thank you We pray in your name. Amen.